good morning um, thank you uh, i would like to thank uh, our indian arthroscopy society for starting a such a nice online education initiative which will be helpful across the globe and i would like to thank our president dr ip sobara and dr swananda samantha our secretary and all the governing council members and office bearers for giving this opportunity so this talk for me is going to be on masic cup tear what are the overview and principles of management so as we know that um, Massive cup tears are a totally a different ball game when you compare to the other kind of type of cup tears, and they are about 10 to 30 percent incidence normally. And we give a definition of massive cup tear when they have more than five centimeter retraction, or when there is two tendon involvement, like supra and infraspinatus tendon, both are involved together and got retracted. And usually, because of the retraction, they are already having fatty atrophy, and there are lots of adhesions between the tendon and the bone. and uh, sometimes there is also associated feature of suprascapular neuropathy which can be seen in almost 10 to about 20% of patients also so a typical patient will be like this where is a, a elderly gentleman who is not who has trivial trauma not able to lift the shoulder actively passively we are able to lift the shoulder up and uh, this gentleman as you can see he had right physiotherapy and uh, with uh, little response x ray showing no evidence of osteoarthritis but uh, as you can see there is uh, reduced acromiohumeral distance and there is proximal migration of the humerus also and another important sign that you can see is somebody who is not able to lift the shoulder or as you can see in the lower picture there is lifting the scapula and uh, lack of external rotation or arm blower sign is also another feature of infraspinatus stair so the most important thing that you see in this mri of this patient is uh, retraction of the cuff cuff is retracted down to the glenoid level and look for the cuff quality as you can see in the sagittal picture where the cuff quality is very bad the cuff is replaced with the fatty tissue and uh, look for the biceps position many times the biceps is subluxed in these patients with massive cuff tear and subscapularis can also be observed very important to note about this is fatty atrophy fatty atrophy as we all know there is a gutelier classification where the stages from stage 0 to 4 normally everybody should have stage 0 but when there is more fat than less than muscle which means we are going towards stage 3 or 4 few fatty sticks is stage 1 stage 2 is less fat than muscle within the muscle when stage 3 is same amount of fat and muscle in stage 4 is more fat than muscle so anyone with stage 3 or 4 and they are quite bad and also trisnatus of the not just supraspinatus so remember all these patient with uh, a massive cup tear had a, uh, at one point they had a smaller or moderate cup tear so our job in here to thinking about managing this patient in terms of surgery is adequate mobilization rotator cuff so that we can achieve the reduction of the rotator cuff to the fit print in simple terms it means convert a massive cuff tear into a smaller or a moderate cuff tear then you can repair it back the treatment options are best is to do a complete repair as the studies show the functional outcome of surgical treatment patient with massive cuff tear comparing complete repair and other modes of management complete repair definitely gives a better outcome if you have an option of doing a surgery best is to a complete repair in an occasion where you are not able to complete repair then other stuff like partial repair or immediate repair or a muscle transfer or other and other things like supra capsule or reconstruction or tendon or other procedures so here in a situation where complete repair is not possible at least do a partial repair what do you mean by doing partial repair is trying to establish the anterior and posterior cable and if sub subscapularis is ruptured try to do the subscapularis repair also by doing this by establishing the anterior posterior cable you can actually get back some movement and also get some function of the patient so while doing arthroscopic rotator cuff repair in a massive cuff tear i go little more than using three portals so some you have to use four or five so occasionally you have six portals also one weaving portal from the posteriorly and one working portal from lateral and there will be too many many two or three accessory lateral portal for managing a suture So this is the typical plan of doing a massive cuff tear repair. So first thing you do is repair your subscapularis tendon. So repairing subscapularis tendon, actually how it helps is 
it brings the supraspinatus and infraspinatus back to a nearer to the footprint area. So what it means is it reduces excursion of the retracted cuff tendon. For example, if you retract it to about 5 centimeter after repairing the subscap tendon, you will find yourself that retracted tendon has come closer. It, is all, it has come closer to almost 2 centimeter. So which will be like 3 centimeter retraction only there now. So that is the reason why you have to address on the subscapularis tendon first. So what I am doing in this particular page is I am and back. So next step is uh, I visualize the acromion in most of the patients and uh, try to release it anteriorly so that you have uh, enough visibility and all the anterior structures which are adhesed are released so that you will have easy excursion of the cuff tendon back to its footprint. So there is always a controversy about doing acromioplasty or not and in order to achieve visualization and also to good release value. and there is also controversy about doing tuberoplasty but I would say tuberoplasty is not an essential surgery but uh, for surprisingly even tuberoplasty patients have also shown to have some better outcome in, in those patients where we are opting for doing a partial repair. So that's the way you do it and when you are trying to release, try to release the spinal scapula far down deep so that the whole structures adhere to the tendon is totally released and freed up back. So that's the next step you normally progress for when you are doing a releases for a magic cup. Next important thing, what I would say is uh, not only releasing superiorly for the uh, tendon, but also inferiorly over the tendon. So which means you have to do supraglenoid release. This is a very essential step of bringing the excursion of the tendon back. In this particular patient, as you can see, the tendon is retracted down to the glenoid. What I am doing is actually releasing the tissue in between the cuff and the glenoid. By doing that, you are totally releasing the, all the additions from right from the 12 o'clock area and going to the 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock area anteriorly and posteriorly coming down to the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock area so that the whole tissues under the supraspinatus and infraspinatus are released and made it free. By doing this, actually, you can increase the skin of the tendon. This is a supraglenoid release where you release releasing the glenoid in the cup circumference. As you can see that now, once you have done the release, you are able to back to closer to the footprint area and this is a very important step I do in majority of the patients who are having massive cup tear. Next is you always think about uh, doing further releases if you are not able to bring that cuff back in place. So one other step that you can do is doing anterior release. So by doing anterior release means you are actually what you are doing is trying to release all the anterior structures which are adhered to the cup tissue and also importantly the coracohemoral ligament. By releasing the coracohemoral ligament what happens is you are increasing the excursion of the uh, retracted tendon to another half to one centimeter. So by that you gain a one centimeter of tissue which can be brought closer to the footprint area. In realistically, I do only about uh, uh, maybe uh, one case in 20 cases of magic capture. That's what uh, is a normal proportion of patients who needs anterior release. And uh, another way of doing it is also to try to release the tendon back posteriorly also. For example, this particular patient who has got a very bad cuff tear which is retracted to the glenoid, what I am doing is I am releasing the cuff tissue in between the supraspinatus and infraspinatus so that uh, you have a nice v shaped tear now and you have two flaps, one flap anteriorly and another flap posteriorly. So what you can do is by after releasing between the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, you created two flaps and that anterior flap will come and sit on the footprint area and similarly, the posterior flap will also come and sit on the footprint area. As you can see in that uh, demonstrated video, the anterior flap is coming down to the footprint. And similarly, posterior flap is also slowly moving towards the footprint area. The problem with this thing is, uh, don't think that uh, uh, this is the, the fancy solution for all the cup tear. Take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, this will help in some patients where you are trying to do partial repair. And uh, there are papers also shown controversially that they may not improve the cup feeling. But it is something is better than nothing when you are not able to do a complete repair. Next thing is when you have the, not able to bring the cuff back in place where it should be, then what you can think about is doing a margin convergence. When you are doing margin convergence, try to make sure you at least take two or three bites anterior and posterior. If you take only one bite, they are not biomechanically strong. And also you can try to do a biceps augmentation 
sometimes to help our reinforcement of your rotator cuff tear. That has also been shown to be effective in terms of preserving the integrity of the rotator cuff in your suture in back. But next thing it comes is uh, when you're doing repair, whether you want to do a single row or double row repair, but in my opinion, what I say is when you are trying to do partial repairs, you are not even able to get your uh, tissue back in place, then uh, you should be do, you should not be worried about whether single row or double row. What you need is a uh, contact in the bone tissue, uh, bone to the uh, rotator cuff tissue as much as you can. Next thing is uh, sometimes you are doing partial repair. When you are doing partial repair, you are trying to encroach on the articular margin sometimes because sometimes you can go and encroach on the articular margin to almost about one half to one centimeter down the articular margin so that you can bring the excursion of the retracted tendon to that area. So here what I am trying to do is uh, putting a traction stitch to mobilize the cuff and also doing a uh, pressuring of the articular surface so that you can reattach that uh, tissue back in place. So the, remember whenever you are trying to do all these uh, massive tears, there is always a high chance of re-tear also. So remember uh, try not to do with too, too much tension on all the cuff tissue. So when I can repair this cuff? Is the cuff is repairable or not? There are some factors which I make it to decide. For example, a tear size more than three and a half centimeters or four centimeters. Whenever there is a fatty atrophy of more than grade three, or when you have acromohumeral distance less than seven mm, or that inferior glenohumeral distance, which means the proximal migration of the humeral head has gone more than five mm, then you think that uh, the cuff may not be repairable. Be aware of thinking about irreparable cuff and doing alternate options like tendon transfers or or ACR or any other alternate procedure. So, but remember that leaving just by doing debridement or doing some kind of repair, like partial repair, definitely the art literature shows that you have a better outcome when you do re partial repair than compared to debridement alone. So, whenever there is an occasion, try to do repair as much as you can in at least a partial repair. When cuff is irreparable, this is a different situation, which is not, I'm not going to talk in detail about this, but just going to give a overview of it. When you, when you are going to a situation where the cuff is not repairable, when you are thinking about and then transfer, superior capsular reconstruction, on worst case scenario, give a shoulder replacement. Think about non-orthoplastic surgical options. Uh, uh, there, is a, there are studies which has compared multiple options like debridement, partial repair, SCR, graft interposition, balloon spacer, LD transfer. Leaving aside the complete repair, complete repair definitely has got a better outcome. When you're going to other options like all these things, the outcome is going to be better, but they are almost all of them work in a similar fashion. The outcome that you have to explain to the patient is going to be about 60 to 70 percent. So the chance of failure rate is going to be about 30 percent in all these procedures. It's a general figure that I'm giving it to you. The rupture rate that occurs in about 8 to 40 percent of patients coming in about two to five years of time. So the satisfaction deteriorates whenever you do alternate option after three years, about 20 to 30% of patients are not very happy. So remember that uh, you, you explain all these to the patient when you are embarking on surgery. So to summarize, for magic of tears, to give an overview, assess the case correctly and decide on repairability. If repairing, try to do complete repair, that's the maximum best you can do. If you are not able to do that situation where you are not able to bring the complete repair, then at least establish a rotator cable. Try to establish a subscapularis mechanism first. Dissect around the cuff to mobilize. Release such as CHL release or interval release may help in selective cases or at least do a medialized or partial cuff repair. To conclude, the success of the magic cuff tear repairability depends on your bringing a tension free repair and taking multiple stitches. But ultimate thing that is going to dictate whether in a repairable muscle is your muscle quality, not more of the surgical thing, it's a muscle quality. So with this, I conclude my talk. It's just you given an overview of it. Irreparable cup is a totally different entity and there is a totally different tap. I have not taken in consideration about all those things in this one. I have only talked about magic after where you can do some kind of repair techniques. Thank you very much.